Hi everyone, my name is Amy Sullivan and I'm the current Vice President-Elect of AAAR and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the, our 18th in our monthly series of as &T lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR being um, supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. So each month, the editors of as &T select a high impact paper to be presented by its authors. With these lectures, we hope to be able to highlight the amazing research happening in our community tie our journal to other activities and give us all an opportunity to come together outside of the annual conference. Um, these lectures are being recorded and you can access them later um, from AAAR's YouTube channel, which you can access from the AAAR website under the events tab. In addition, each month, one of our lecture, the lectures are being um, hosted by one of AAAR's student chapters. And so I wanna thank everyone who's helped to make these possible and all of you for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, one of our newest student chapters from the University of Maryland. Hello, everyone. We appreciate your attendance at this month's ASNT lecture, which will be on molecular composition and gas particle partitioning of indoor cooking aerosols. Insights from FAGRO, CIMS, and kinetic aerosol modeling. I am Devan Shastogi. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Maryland College Park. And I am being supervised by Dr. Akuya Asa Abuku in the Environmental Aerosol Research Laboratory. I'm also the current president of AAAR student chapter at University of Maryland College Park. I'm delighted to introduce you all to our speaker for today, Dr. Catherine Masood. Dr. Masood received her PhD in chemical engineering from University of Texas at Austin in August of 2022. She was a part of Dr. Lee Hild Hildebrandt Jewish group, which studies indoor and outdoor air quality. During her PhD, she worked on various projects, including studying atmospheric chlorine chemistry using environmental chamber experiments, measuring chlorine and chlorinated species at unconventional oil land gas development regions in Texas, and finally, studying the impact of activities such as cooking on indoor air quality, which is what she will be talking about in today's lecture. After completing her PhD, Dr. Masood joined an environmental consulting firm, AECOM, in Houston, Texas where she is currently an air quality specialist working with air permitting and air quality measurement groups. A quick reminder for the audience that there will be about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. Please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box and we will go through them in order. With that, I turn the floor to Dr. Masood. Dr. Masood, the floor is all yours. Awesome, thank you so much, Duanch. Um, thank you guys for having me and letting us share our work. I'm excited to be able to share our work that was published uh, last October in Aerosol Science and Technology. And thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, our paper was titled The Molecular Composition and Gas Particle Partitioning of Indoor Cooking Aerosol, Insights from a Figaro Sims and Kinetic Aerosol Modeling. Before I begin, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the co-authors of this paper for their valuable contributions to the work. Um, I'd like to thank Ying Lee, Simon Wong, Aaron Katz, Professors Pete DiCarlo, Delphine Farmer, Marina Vance, Mana Bushiraiwa, and uh, my PhD advisor at the time that I did this project, Dr. Leah Hildebrandt Ruiz. I'd also like to thank the entire Home Chem Science team for making the campaign, campaign a successful and enjoyable one. And finally, I'd like to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and the Indoor Chem Program for their support of this work. So I'll begin by discussing the motivation for this work. Um, it's been well known in the scientific community that air pollution can have harmful impacts on human health. Atmospheric scientists have spent decades trying to understand and characterize pollutants in the outdoor atmosphere, which has resulted in great strides in environmental policy, including the Clean Air Act, which has placed standards for exposure to certain criteria pollutants. On the other hand, um, there have been a limited number of studies that have looked at sources, emission rates, or chemical properties of indoor air pollutants. And this is unfortunate, especially given the fact that a study published back in 2001 showed that the average human spends about 90% of their time indoors. With recent COVID-related lockdowns, that number was probably much higher in the last two years. Um, this means that while it's important to, it's very important to regulate air pollutants outdoors, most of our exposure does come from being in indoor environments such as our homes, classrooms, and offices, making it essential to understand um, the pollutants in the indoor air. 
So it's been shown that the outcome of exposure to indoor air pollutants can depend on number one, the chemical composition of the pollutants, and second, the physical state of the pollutants, that is whether they, they are in the vapor or the particle phase. So to study these two elements of indoor air pollutants, we conducted a four-week indoor air campaign in June of 2018, where we simulated or enacted um, cooking, cleaning, and occupancy activities in a realistic home environment. Um, the tests were conducted at the UT test house at the University of Austin's Pickle Research Center, which is where our lab was. And right outside the house, um, as you can see in this picture here, there were a number of trailers which carried instrumentation from 20 different groups. Um, our group in particular used the Figaro Sims um, instrument to investigate chemical composition and gas particle partitioning of aerosol that was released during cooking events. So our Figaro Sims was stationed in one of those dedicated aerosol trailers outside the test house that I showed in the previous slide, with the sampling inlets to it placed inside the kitchen. Um, so that's that circle star that's shown on the top diagram. For this work, we've chosen to focus our analysis on cooking events. In particular, we'll be focusing on two kinds of experiment days. First was a simulated Thanksgiving day where we roasted a whole turkey in the oven. We made a number of Thanksgiving side dishes um, on the stovetop and in the oven. And second, we will look at the layered days, which are days that had a combination of cooking, cleaning, and occupancy activities. The layered days that we're looking at in particular had an English breakfast, a vegetarian stir fry, a beef chili dinner, and intermittent cleaning activities in between all of these cooking events. So I've already mentioned that we use a Figaro Sims instrument to characterize the pollutants that we saw in the indoor air. I'll now spend the next couple of slides talking about how this instrument operates. So the instrument we're using is a high resolution time of flight chemical ionization mass spectrometer. Uh, we run it in iodide mode, um, which gives, and the SIMS in general gives us real time information on the amount of chemicals in the vapor phase. How it works is that the sampled air from the kitchen enters our instrument, and in the ion molecule reaction region, it um, comes into contact with a negatively charged ion. So in our case, that was iodide or I minus. And here they form a negatively charged adduct. So by applying voltages in the vacuum or the time of flight chamber, we can get the charged adducts to travel in a, in a V-shaped flight path to the detector. So the time it takes for the ions to fly through this um, vacuum chamber is proportional to their molar mass. So from the time of flight, we can get their mass to charge number or more molar mass. And from there, we can make an educated guess about their molecular formula. So there's two caveats that I'd like to point out here. The first is that the SIMS run in iodide mode is most sensitive to moderate to highly oxidized species, um, nitrogen containing species and halogenated species. It's not as sensitive to other species outside these three. Um, the second caveat is that while the SIMS can help us measure the molecular formula of sampled compounds, it doesn't distinguish distinguish between isomers, which are compounds that have the same molecular formula. And this is an important caveat, especially when it comes to our upcoming discussion of volatility. So the instrument, as was shown in the previous slide, only gave us gas phase information. In order to get information on particles, we added a filter inlet for gases and aerosols, or Figaro for short, to our chemical ionization mass spectrometer. So the Figaro operates in two modes. In the gas sampling mode, we measure the concentration of gas-based species in real time through this gas inlet. And at the same time, um, we're collecting particles onto a Teflon filter. So for this work in particular, we calculated, uh, we collected aerosol onto the Teflon filter for a period of about 20 to 60 minutes, depending on the concentration of organic aerosol inside the house. In the particle desorption mode, um, or the heating mode, an actuator slides the filter over to align on top of the instrument, and then heated nitrogen flows over this filter that contains the aerosols, so that any particles or aerosol on the filter can evaporate or desorb, and then that can be detected as vapor phase um, within the instrument. 
And these program temperature program desorptions for the home camp campaign took place over 40 minutes. So what you're seeing on the bottom left um, figure over here is the normalized intensity or the percentage of the maximum signal for the particle phase. And that's shown against the prog progressively increasing desorption temperatures or time on the x-axis. So given that these compounds, the three compounds shown here, have different volatilities, um, you'll see that they desorb at different temperatures, where the temperature uh, at which the maximum signal is seen is known as the Tmax value. And that's shown with the dotted lines for each of these species. The integrated area, so the area under this thermogram or desorption curve, um, gives us the amount of any given compound in the particle phase. So it's important to note once again that this instrument can't give us a direct measure of a vapor pressure, but we can use um, different measurements from the instrument to infer vapor pressure or saturation concentration. So how exactly do we use these measurements from the Figaro Sims to estimate volatility? As I mentioned in the previous slide, we can use the integrated area under the desorption plot or thermogram as it's commonly referred to, to calculate the particle signal in ions per volume. And that's that first equation over here. And the second equation shows us that we use the average gas signal in ions per second and the same sampling rate of two liters per minute to calculate our gas signal in ions per volume. Finally, um, we divide the particle phase signal over the sum of the gas and the particle fa phase signal, which helps us to find out the fraction of a compound in the particle phase, or FP for short. And then we can use this FP value to estimate saturation concentration or vapor pressure. Moving on to the kinetic aerosol modeling portion of this work, which was work that was led by Ying Lee and Professor Manabusharaiwa at UC Irvine, we use the kinetic multi-layer model of gas particle interactions in aerosols and clouds, um, or cam gap model for short, for two object objectives. The first was to calculate equilibration time scales in gas particle partitioning. And the second was to simulate the partitioning number for individual compounds with different saturation concentrations. So in terms of the inputs to this cam gap model, we use the glass transition temperature, or TG, to characterize viscosity of the aerosol. TG was predicted using a parameterization from Dirio et al, um, shown here. The bulk diffusion coefficient was calculated using the Stokes-Einstein equation. Finally, the full equilibration time scale was calculated when the following criterion in this equality, inequality was met. Um, the absolute value of the concentration of a compound in the particle phase minus the equilibrium mass concentration of the compound divided by the initial mass concentration of the part partitioning compound in the particle phase minus the equilibrium mass concentration of the, part uh, of the compound in the particle phase had to be less than 1% for this um, full equilibration time scale to be met. All right, let's jump into some results. Um, so on the right hand side, you're seeing the particle phase mass spectrum on a layered day when a beef chili dinner was being cooked. So we saw that when occupants prepared the beef chili, we observed signature compounds, including um, C6, H9, and 3O2, which is the molecular formula of histidine. And that's potentially released um, from beef and beans. And we also saw C2H2O4, which is the molecular formula of oxalic acid, which was potentially released from bell peppers. The figure on the bottom shows the particle phase mass spectrum before, during, and after a sweet potato casserole was cooked. So we observed quite a few notable signals, um, which included C6H6O3, likely isomaltol, uh, which was released from the caramelization of sugar. And we also saw several compounds um, associated with butter, such as um, the formulas over here, which can potentially be um, from margaric acid, palmitic acid, and stearic acid. The key takeaway from this slide is that we can use particle phase mass spectra from the figurosins to identify signature emissions, which we found to be consistent with corresponding cooking events in these two cases. So moving on, 
we did use the figure of SIMS data to identify all the compounds that we can find in the gas and particles phases. So more specifically, we identified 481 compounds in the gas and the particle phases. And out of these, 169 compounds were attributed to cooking activities. Uh, we grouped in this figure over here, we grouped the identified molecular formulas into the following elemental groups. So the first is CHO, that is basically the group of compounds that contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms only. Uh, there's also CHNO, CHClO, CHClNO, CHN, CHSO, and CHNSO. So the figure here summarizes the molar distribution of identified compounds in the particle phase based on elemental groups for different cooking events. So we have the layered days three and four uh, with different cooking events over there shown in this legend. And we also have the Thanksgiving days one and two. So we see that for all the reported cooking events, the CHO group shown in green had the highest contribution overall. And that ranged from around 74 to 85%. And the second highest contribution came from the CHNO group, shown in blue over here, um, which ranged from 12 to 19%. So an interesting thing to note here is that the CHNO group contribution seemed to correlate with the protein content of the meal. Um, so based on the ingredients that were being cooked, that is um, the meat and plant-based uh, protein content of the food, we presume that the level of protein was highest for the beef chili dinner, which contained beef and beans. And surely enough, the CHNO concentration was at 19%. And we also assume that it was lowest for the veg vegetable stir fry, um, which had the CHNO contribution of 12%. Finally, on the right side of the plot is the categorical distribution of observed compounds on the second simulated Thanksgiving day, TG2. And this shows that for the cooking, for this particular cooking center day, the source category with the highest percentage of compounds was indeed the cooking category, um, followed by the commercials emission, commercial emissions category, which was at 10% and primarily consisted of cleaning products because as you'll remember, there were some intermittent cleaning activities whenever there were cooking centered days. All right, moving on to the next figure. In this figure, we plot the aggregated signal separated by the carbon number on the X axis and the oxygen number shown by these different colors. Um, and we did this for a layered day English breakfast and a Thanksgiving day, the second simulated Thanksgiving day. We see that within the CHO elemental groups shown in the, these two figures, certain um, compounds dominated the distribution. For example, for the English breakfast prepared on a layered day and for the simulated Thanksgiving day, contributions from C3, C6, um, C6, C10, and C18 um, are among the most prominent within the CHO group. During the two cooking events, we measured high levels of C6H10O5, which is the formula corresponding to levoglucosan, which is widely used um, as a tracer for biomass burning. We also saw that certain species, which had formulas corresponding to lin linoleic and oleic acids, um, were measured on both days with a slightly higher concentration observed on the Thanksgiving day. And this is consistent in our opinion with more fatty acid emissions uh, from the meals that were prepared on that day, such as the Thanksgiving turkey or the cooking oils or butter um, used in preparation of that gravy. So overall from these two figures, we see that there's a variety of com compounds that the figure of sims can observe. And this variety highlights the diversity of chemical species that are released during different cooking events, and therefore the diversity of chemical species that we as indoor occupants are exposed to. I'm going to switch gears now a little bit to talk about the gas particle partitioning of the species that we measured during home chem. On the left-hand plot, we're looking at the fraction of a compound in the particle phase. Um, plotted against its mass to charge ratio. I'll remind you that we get this FP value using the equation shown on the top right here, which is basically the particle signal divided by the sum of the gas and the particle signal. We can see that the fraction of the compounds in the particle phase 
correlates with the mass to charge ratio. There is some scatter, uh, especially around mass to charge 100 to 200. So we pulled some of these compounds, specifically the compounds with mass to charge ratio 133 to 163, shown on the right hand side figure. And we plotted these FPs against the, the compound's oxidation state value. So the positive correlation here shows us that the scatter can be explained indeed by the functional groups of the compounds sampled. So the FP of a compound not only depends on its molecular weight, but also on the functional groups in the compound itself. Okay, so another thing that we wanted to investigate was whether the total concentration of organic aerosol in the indoor environment had an impact on the individual FP values for different compounds. So in this figure over here, we're looking at the measured fraction in the particle phase plotted against the mass to charge ratio at different times over here so, uh, during a simulated Thanksgiving day. The size of um, the marker, so we have green, purple, and black markers, the size of these markers indicate the magnitude of the concentration of organic aerosol, or COA, which you'll see range from about 0.4 micrograms per meter cubed to 134 micrograms per, per meter cubed. So it's most evident that towards the higher, it's most evident towards the higher mass to charge, but we can see that in general, um, the fraction of a compound in the particle phase decreases as the concentration of organic aerosol in the environment decreases. This simply tells us that dilution, for example, due to ventilation, can lead to lower concentration of concentrations of compounds in the particle phase. So next, we were interested in comparing how the Figaro sims derived volatilities compared to volatilities estimated based on parametrizations. Specifically, we used a parametrization by Yingli and colleagues, uh, which estimates a saturation concentration based solely on the molecular formula of the measured species. That is, it just uses the number of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms to predict the saturation concentration. For our experimentally derived saturation concentrations, we used partitioning theory to convert our measured FP values for each compound to a saturation concentration value based on the concentration of organic aerosol indoors at the time of sampling. So this figure sh here shows us the experimental saturation concentration on the y-axis based on partitioning theory and our Figaro Sims derived FP values. Um, and We've seen them, uh, we're seeing them here for um, stir fry days, layered days, and um, Thanksgiving days. And on the x axis, we see the model saturation concentrations corresponding to these uh, FP values or the, to these fitted compounds. And this is based purely on the parametrization, which takes into account the numbers of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. We see in general that the model saturation concentrations are underestimated which led us to want to study the phase state of these particles that we are um, analyzing and the equilibration time scales of the aerosol that we've sampled. So this brings us to our um, KM gap model results. So the figure here shows the temporal evolution of predicted FP for condensing compounds with saturation concentrations varying from 10 to the power of minus 2 to 10 to the 6 micrograms per meter cube. And this is at a measured concentration of organic aerosol of 134 micrograms per meter cube and a temperature of about 323 Kelvin, which were the conditions at the simulated Thanksgiving day that we're looking at in this figure. The calculated viscosity um, was 2.2 to 10 to the power of 3 Pascal second, indicating that the cooking air, uh, organic aerosol adopted a semi-solid state. Um, so the solid black line over here shows equilibri equilibrium FP values that were calculated by partitioning theory at COA of 134 microgram per meter cube, again, assuming ideal mixing, mixing conditions. The black dots here um, capture the actual measured FP values during sampling. When the system reaches full equilibrium, um, the predicted FP should be very close to the FP that is calculated by partitioning theory. The fact that the dots fall at higher FP values than the equilibrium partitioning predicts tells us that the sampled compounds may have been em emitted primarily in the particle phase, and they were sampled before they had fully partitioned, which explains higher um, FP values. 
We then investigated the equilibration timescale for the scenario shown in the previous slide. And we saw that equilibration timescales can be up to 15 minutes, whereas the sampling residence times um, for many of our sampling um, time blocks were around three seconds. This may explain the discrepancy that we saw in a previous slide between the experimentally determined saturation concentration versus the saturation concentration that was calculated from the parameterization, which I'll remind you might be because the experimental FP values we measured were higher than if equilibrium conditions were met. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit again. Um, I'm going to talk about another neat finding from this paper that we didn't get to delve too much into in the main manuscript, but we spent some time talking about this in the supplement. And this is basically the comparison of Tmax values to FP values, um, both that we both values that we get from the Figaro Sims and both used as metrics to measure volatility from the Figaro Sims. So while doing this work, we recognize that many Figaro Sims users utilize Tmax values and calibrate their instruments in a way that allows them to calculate saturation concentration based on Tmax. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to directly calibrate our instrument in a way that converts Tmax into saturation concentrations, but we did have Tmax and FP values for all of the compounds that we sampled. And so this is what you're seeing plotted in this figure over here. So for, for compounds that we had, we plotted their um, recorded Tmax value against their fraction in the particle phase. Um, all of the points are colored by their mass to charge ratio shown uh, in this legend on the right here. Um, so the red colors or towards the red part of the scale, that's lowering the, showing the lower mass to charges and towards the more blue or purple part of the scale that's showing the higher mass to charges. So if both metrics uh, were equally good at um, capturing or inferring volatility, we would have found that um, the, um, the Tmax and the fraction of the particle phase of all these compounds correlate pretty well together, which we do to an extent find. So this um, line is just added for vis a visual aid. So we see that for most of these compounds, the fraction in the particle phase does in fact positively correlate with Tmax values. But we see that for some um, compounds, especially towards the top left part, the top left quadrant of this figure, we see that they have very high Tmax values, but low fractions in the particle phase. Um, and that at the first side can be a little bit confusing because if a particle had a high Tmax value, that means it had um, a lower vapor pressure, which means it would have to have a higher fraction in the particle phase. But we're seeing that these compounds have a high Tmax, but a low FP value. And so that led us to like investigate a little bit more closely, what are these compounds that we're seeing that have ha such high Tmax values? So these are just some examples that we have seen. So C C3H6O2, C8H18O2, um, and so on and so forth. And you'll see that most of these uh, markers are colored by having lower mass to charges. So that tells us that these are potentially uh, compounds that are thermal decomposition products uh, from our Figaro desorption runs. And so they might be captured at high Tmax values because they are thermal decomposition products. But in fact, this um, smaller molecule could be coming from a parent larger molecule, which had a much higher fraction in the particle phase. So this visualization is pretty neat in that it helps us uh, combine imp information from Tmax and FB, both derived from the Figaro Sims, to help us understand what um, compounds we're fitting might be thermal decomposition products. And that obviously influences um, the analysis that we continue to do afterwards. So this brings me to the conclusion of our work. Um, so we detected or we measured 480 unique molecular formulas by the Figaro Sims um, during several cooking events at the Home Chem campaign. We found that molecular formulas which contained carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, um, nitrogen, chlorine, and sulfur atoms, we identified these and we uh, attributed these to potential sources. We found that the group containing only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms constituted the majority of the emissions in the particle phase. 
at um, 74 to 85%, followed by the CHNO group at 12 to 19%. We use the KM gap model to investigate equilibration timescales at different concentrations of organic aerosol and sampling temperatures. And we found that it can take up to 14 seconds to reach equilibrium at the experimental conditions, which is 322 Kelvin. And it can take up to 15 minutes at 298 Kelvin. Whereas our sampling timescales for our Figaro Sims runs were much shorter at about 2.7 seconds. We found that when comparing the experimentally and empirically derived saturation concentrations, we found that this, um, this comparison indicated that the compounds may have been primarily released in the particle phase during cooking events and were sampled by the Figaro Sims before they had fully equilibrated with the gas phase. We also compared Figaro derived Tmax and FB values as measures of volatility, and so that saw that both metrics together can provide really useful insight into the volatility and thermal decomposition of certain Figaro Sims measured species. And finally, our work highlights the fact that the chemical diversity and the wide range of volatilities of species sampled during centered events, this, it highlighted the importance of understanding aerosol emissions and partitioning in indoor spaces where people spend the most of their time. So I want to thank you all for listening. And again, thanks for the opportunity to share our work. Um, this is my contact information and the contact information of my PhD advisor, Dr. Leah Hildebrand Ruiz. And you can feel free to ask us questions now or contact us later um, to ask about this work. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Masood. It was a really interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? You can go ahead and type it in the chat, chat box below. We have a question um, from Diego. When you collect M by Z ions from the TOF MS, how did you assign their molecular formulas? And did, did you use the Kendrick mass defect to find the common groups of ions and then use the molecular formula to cal formula calculator with specific parameters to assign them based on their lowest PPM error? Uh, that's a great question. So for our case, we what we we have a high resolution time of flight chemical ionization mass spectrometer. So we fit the compounds based on our knowledge of the kind of cooking event that was going on. So if it was a primarily um, cooking event, I expected to see compounds that were that had formulas that could be attributed to fatty acids, for example. If it was a cleaning event, I expected to find formulas that might have um, fluorinated species. And so we used our knowledge of um, the kind of events that were going on. And we also looked at the iodide mass defect to fit our, um, our high resolution fitted species with the lowest error. But we did not directly use Kendrick mass defect plots. No, we didn't. But it's a great approach um, to fitting species for sure. We have another question from uh... Carsten, did you measure from formic acid or was it was this CPD too volatile? Um, so we we did measure the formula that could have corresponded to formic acid, but we couldn't say for sure that it was formic acid or some kind of decomposition product. So we didn't focus our analysis too much on it, especially because we were more interested in um, the aerosol aspect of this work. So yeah. We have a question from Caitlin. How did you decide on the Fiagro thermal desorption timing, 40 minutes versus 60 minutes extra? And how often to change filters? What did you find was the max mass loading the filter could handle? That's a great question. Um, OK. Uh, can you repeat the first part of that? Let me answer it one by one. <laughs> first part says asks about how did you decide on the Fagro thermal desorption timings? Okay, um, so the time that it that we were using to collect the 
aerosols, it ranged from 20 to 60 minutes, just based on um, the concentration of organic aerosols in the indoor environment. So at the beginning of the campaign, we were uh, leaning more towards longer time periods, so towards 60 minutes. But then towards um, the latter end of the campaign, we decided that we would rather focus on the first 20 minutes of the top of the hour, which was aligned with the most kind of activity related to the cooking events. And then we used the other 40 minutes of the hour um, where it was less active in terms of cooking activities to desorb our filter. So it was really just the fact that we wanted to have um, data points for every hour. Um, so that meant 20 minutes of sampling or collecting particles, and then 40 minutes of desorption to form those 60 minutes. That was the, uh, the idea behind this. What we did was we, um, we changed out the filters whenever we saw that it was visibly um, soiled. Um, so uh, um, at the start of each day, we would do flow rate checks and um, just checking visibly what the filter looks like and if it looked like it was uh, deformed in any way or soiled, which um, it wasn't really deformed, but yeah, it, it would get very dirty. Uh, we would know to change out the filter then and then run a couple of blank filter desorptions just to um, stabilize the emissions that we're reading off of the filter. Um, but yeah, is there any other part of that question that I missed answering? I think you answered the question, both of, both of the parts. Okay. <laughs> so Emmy, uh, thanks you for the talk and for the figure where you, and she's asking for the figure where you present percentage contribution of different functional groups. Mm -hmm. It looks like that you, you're just taking into account the data from the uh, ICIMS. Did you think about yes. how might this might shift, uh, how this might shift uh, if there is significant concentration of monos functional species? which the ICIMS is much less sensitive to? That's a great question. Um, honestly, for this work, we only focused on the data that we had from the iodide sims. We didn't really think too much about um, what the distribution would look like if we had um, sensitivity to different species. Um, I would think that with this kind of cooking activity with like oxidized compounds, I think that we are capturing the major compounds of interest. Obviously, there's a lot that we're not seeing with the iodide sims, but I, I'm really not sure how the distribution with, would change, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. So we have Mehdi from uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, mm -hmm. He asked the presence of CHNO group compound in the cooking is interesting. Uh, do you have any data for the emission of CHNO from heated cooking oils? Um, directly from heated cooking oils? No, that that's not something that we did. But I, I think there's studies on, ha, that have been done um, just looking at emissions from cooking oils. Uh, so if you want to reach out to me, I can probably send you some of these references. But and within home chem, we were less focused on like um, the the minute details of this is what this cooking oil emits, and more. We were more focused on creating a realistic home setting to figure out what are the emissions that like an average human cooking indoors is exposed to. But there have been studies, I think, looking mainly at cooking oils, and I can share those with you if you'd like to reach out to me after this. Question from Zolanta. Is there a way to quantify the emissions of various compounds? And are there any standard compounds to be applied for, uh, for the quality assessment? Um, so let me answer the first question. So with SIMS, um, the, the, the analysis that we've done here, we're, you're right, we're mainly focusing on signal. So it's um, the concentrations we're getting are in ions per second, and we're assuming those to be proportional to um, their uh, mass or molar composition, rather. Um, we In this work, we did not calibrate in a way that we could get the quantities out of these um, signals, but our lab 
in future um, years has been working on trying to quantify these signals that we're getting from the iodide sims. But I know that this is like a, a big area of research. And so um, it's definitely an important question. But for this work, especially, we, we just focused on our values in ions per second rather than a PPB or a micrograms per meter cube value. Um, the second question was about a standard compound, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. So the, I can repeat that. So sure. uh, are there any standard compounds to be uh, applied for the quality assessment? Okay, so in this in this field campaign in particular, we worked uh, with the Jimenez group and um, calibrated our uh, Figaro Sims uh, once or twice during the campaign with um, I believe it was ole oleic acid and a number of other acids. Um, but we didn't really end up using those standards to try to quantify or convert our ions per second um, value to a microgram per meter cube value, just because we felt there was a little too much uncertainty there. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. So there's a question from Yevgen. He, uh, uh, the question is about how would you apply your method to studying ambient aerosols? Um, can, can the person who asked the question uh, clarify more? <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, well, let me let me give it a shot. So we've actually used our Figaro Sims in outdoor field campaigns as well. Uh, most recently, so I've used this instrument in environmental chamber experiments. So just like pulling air from an environmental chamber, we've used it in this indoor field campaign that we did. So sampling from uh, an inlet that was placed in the kitchen near where the cooking events were taking place. But we've also used the Figaro Sims in outdoor settings. So our lab, um, uh, I think two years ago, we went to Carn City to measure um, emissions in an unconventional oil and gas development region. And we used the Figaro Sims. Um, we pulled air from an inlet through a window and we were measuring in that way. The difference with outdoor air is that you have concentrations of organic aerosol that are much lower. And so to have like a clear enough particle phase desorption signal, we often we found that we often have to sample or collect particles for an hour or two at a time just to get a good enough amount of particles to see that good uh, desorption um, signal or thermogram. But yeah, it's the same. It works the same way indoors and outdoors. It's just a difference would be sampling rates that you're looking at, maybe location of your sampling inlet. But the data that comes out of it is the same. Tian Ren asks, do you think the unsaturated oils in aerosol phase gets oxidized by indoor oxidants at a given air exchange rate? He's curious about how this how sensitive I adduct is for aerosol phase compounds with oxygen number greater than seven. Okay, so for, I'll deal with the first question first. So, uh, do we know if the compounds that we have could have been oxidized by oxidants in the indoor air? So that was something that uh, a couple of other groups had looked at. Um, I know there was. Um, looking they were looking into chlorine oxidation oh oxidation and ozone oxidation i think for this work we saw that because of the sampling time scales so if you'll remember i said it's like we sample like three minutes in uh, sorry three seconds that's the um residence time so there wasn't enough opportunity for us to um <laughs> give these compounds time to oxidize and so it's hard to tell if the compounds that we're measuring are maybe oxidation products from a previous time period that we're sampling now versus um, things that are being currently oxidized. But we saw that for this work, most of the um, most of the compounds that we were sam sampling were most likely um, primarily emitted pollutants rather than um, things that were rather than compounds that were oxidized and then formed SOA. And then what was the second part of the question? <laughs> So he's curious about how the sensitivity I adduct is for for aerosol phase compounds with oxygen greater than seven, oxygen number greater than seven. Okay, that's a good question. So um, for this particular work, 
I think our limit, we only saw things up to 10 or 11 oxygen atoms. We didn't really try to understand how the sensitivity drops um, from say seven oxygen atoms to 11, but there have been studies that have looked at iodide stem sensitivity to oxidized species. And I believe that the it can see up to either 12 or 15 oxygen atoms. My, my memory is a little fuzzy, so I can probably reach out to this person uh, with this paper. But yeah, our work in particular didn't try to study how iodide sim sensitivity changes with oxygen um, numbers, but there have been other studies that have looked at that very closely. The question uh, by Carsten, he says, uh, was the kitchen stove fueled by natural gas or was it electric? Um, I think, I believe it was electric. Yes. If someone here from home chem knows otherwise, feel free to jump in and answer. <laughs> I think we don't have any more questions uh, <laughs> in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, go ahead and type. There's another question. Sorry, I was just going to clarify that most of the cooking was actually on a, on a gas stove. We used propane because of what was available at home chem. And then we did a couple of experiments um, on an electric stove. Awesome. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> so there's a question from Chin Yen. Uh, he thanks you for the presentation. He's asking, I'm curious about how you define the start and the end of different events. For example, if the cooking event starts or ends based on the stove being turned on or off. Additionally, did you observe any aerosol concentration increase after the end of the cooking events? That's a great question. Okay, so there for home chem, um, kind of the the people who decided on the schedule, um, they had a very fixed sort of uh, schedule of events in that, for example, the the participants who were doing these cooking experiments um, at say 105 p.m. they knew that's when you turn the stove on. Um, at 107, that's when you add this ingredient or that ingredient. So there was a very fixed schedule of events that we had to refer to. Um, for my particular work, um, so like I said, we sampled for the first 20 minutes of an hour and then desorbed for the next 40 minutes. So I'm using the cooking event as those 20 minutes of sampling that I'm doing and obviously using my knowledge of the schedule to see if there was actual cooking going on at that time or if it was just like a period of um, no activity. Um, yeah. I think we are out of questions now. We don't, this, there was a lot of questions, but I think we have been through all of them. Um, <laughs> if, feel free to reach out to either me or Leah. Um, I think our emails are on here. If you have any more questions that there, we didn't have a chance to get to, please feel free to reach out and try to answer you. I can ask you something uh, that I've been wondering about. I don't, I don't work, uh, you know, I don't have any experience working with aerosols from cooking, but uh, this is the question I was thinking about in terms of uh, when you're cooking, you do smell, you know, the food after it has been cooked for hours, right? Even if you have good uh, ventilation in the room. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if, if the volatility of the compound, which you can essentially detect hours after cooking, uh, like, is it like, generally a low volatile compound? Uh, is it something which it stays there for a while or, or it has to do with the resuspension activities that could happen uh, in the room? So if you can. Uh, sure, I could share my opinion. I haven't done work on this in particular, but I think probably if you have a compound that has low volatility and it's kind of depositing onto furniture in the room, then yeah, resuspension hours later can lead to, um, that odor that you're smelling. But also um, you can have things continuously partitioning. So even if something was emitted in the particle phase, you can be um, kind of smelling or measuring those gas phase emissions a while later if things are continuing to partition. Uh, but I haven't done research on this area in general, but that's a great question. <laughs> Uh, 
And actually that reminded me of the second part of the previous question, which was someone asked if we found that the concentrations have ever increased after the cooking event was over. That was the case. We didn't talk about this in our work, but it was the case when um, some cooking activities were followed by cleaning with um, certain chlorinated compounds. They found that uh, there was a good bump in the amount of PM or pollutants that were measured. Um, and so that does happen, especially when there is cleaning involved, just because probably because of the oxidation activity that happens at that point. Okay. I don't see any more questions, Catherine. So awesome. Thank you so much, Duant. <laughs> and thank you all for being here and for your questions. <laughs> Yeah, we, have, we are on schedule. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Uh, and I appreciate the chance to host uh, this lecture series as the president of AAA student chapter. And thank you uh, for this fantastic talk, uh, Dr. Masood. Awesome. Thank you again, Dewanj. And thank you all. Have a great day. Okay, well, uh, thanks for um, hosting and 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 doing the lecture. Um, they were great, and we had a wonderful discussion. And there was um, over ninety people um, attending. So nice. awesome! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, it was great to meet you guys. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs> yeah, you too. Bye.